Welcome back and thank you for joining us. This is Inclusive Design 24 2022. A big thank you to our platinum sponsors, Fable and Intopia, and to our gold sponsors, Barrier Break, TPGI, and UX for the win. Uh, if you use Twitter, you can find us at ID24Conf, and the hashtag that we'll be using for the duration of this conference is hashtag ID24. Uh, that's the numbers two four. Um, and you know, while you're watching on YouTube, another thing you could do, if you're so inclined, is participate in the live chat, and we'll be monitoring that for questions and comments and feedback. Uh, so, with all that said, I'm going to hand it over now to my co-host Kenji. Uh, take it away. Hi, hello, good morning, and good evening from Japan. I am delighted to be your uh, guest host today. I'm Kenji. Thank you. And our next speaker is Claire Sudbury. Um, <clears throat> and she is an independent technical coach with 22 years of software engineering experience. Well, it's pretty cool. And so please take it away, Claire. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to start by telling you a very short story. So no eyes needed. All you need to do is listen. Once upon a time, there was a woman who was a software engineer. She was a software engineer who had a background in math, so she had a maths degree. And that meant that she was used to being in a minority as a woman, uh, because women can't do maths. Um, but this, I mean, that hopefully sounds ridiculous, but this was actually reinforced by her experience, having done a maths degree where she was maybe one of 5% of the course who were female. Um, and she came to IT uh, what felt to her uh, late. So she did a whole math degree without ever having done any computing uh, and then did a couple of years of working as a housing officer as all things. So when she got her first job in IT, she felt intimidated. It seemed like she was surrounded by men who had been doing, uh, who'd been programming computers since they were children. And she was the only woman, the only female programmer. Um, so she always felt like she didn't really know what she was doing. And then in her second job, she kept getting knocked back when she asked to do the more interesting work. Um, she kept being told no. Uh, and then she interviewed for another job in a more senior position and faced incredulity that why on earth would she be applying for a job like that? Surely she didn't know enough. After 12 years of this, she was made redundant and it was a relief. She didn't want to work in IT anymore. She felt like she'd never quite felt like she really knew what she was doing and she left the industry altogether. Okay, so you can open your eyes if they were closed. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do now is just cross your fingers and now uncross them if you know everything about everything. Uncross them if you never have to Google anything related to your sphere of expertise. I was tempted to say uncross them if you've ever laughed at anyone for not knowing stuff, but that would be me shaming you and I'm not here to do that. So I'm expecting that a lot of you will still have your fingers crossed. Uncross your fingers if you think you should know more than you do. Uncross them if you worry that people will find out you don't know much about the latest hot topic. Uncross them if you've ever considered switching roles or careers because you can't keep up. OK, if there is anybody left with your fingers still crossed, you can uncross your fingers. I was kind of assuming there wouldn't be any left by that point. So the title of this talk is Let's Stop Making Each Other Feel Stupid. My name is Claire Sudbury. I've been a software engineer for 22 years. Um, I'm an independent net technical agile coach, as has already been explained, and that means that it's my job to help people to develop effective software. And I have particular expertise in techniques such as test-driven development, refactoring, and all of the good collaborative stuff, so like pair working, ensemble working, and I'm available. So do reach out to me if you think I might be able to help you or your team. Imagine a world with no imposter syndrome where everyone arrives at work excited about learning new things and nobody ever worries about not knowing enough. Because being an effective IT professional is not about what you know, but we think it is, and that causes problems. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. 
So you might have guessed already, the story that I told at the start was about me. I have been in this industry for 22 years, but there was a gap in the middle of my career of four years when I left the industry altogether after having been in it for 12 years. I was made redundant and I left the industry because I felt inadequate. But why did I feel inadequate and what did I feel inadequate about? The thing is that I felt stupid all the time. I never felt like I knew as much as everyone else. I always felt like everybody else knew what they were doing and I didn't. But these days, as well as coaching, I also run training courses, boot camps, workshops, and I'm very aware of how often everyone feels stupid. And in previous roles, I've noticed my colleagues, my direct reports, my mentees, all constantly feeling like they didn't know enough. They weren't clever enough. They didn't know what they were doing. And over the years that I've been in this industry, I've noticed a lot of behaviours that I believe help to perpetuate this feeling, that cause this feeling of stupidity. So what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to run through some of those behaviours. I'm going to talk about their impact. And I'm going to talk about some things that we might be able to do to mitigate it, some ways that we might be able to do things differently. So these are the problems that I'm going to talk about. And for each one, I'll talk about the problem, I'll talk about its impact, and I'll talk about possible solutions. I'm going to talk about judging people for lack of knowledge, laughing at people for lack of knowledge, talking in jargon, individuals and companies who are often reluctant to train juniors. I'm going to talk about gatekeeping, only letting certain people through the hallowed gates of software engineering. I'm going to talk about the idea of rock star developers, special individuals who are better than everyone else. I'm going to talk about, as individuals, how sometimes we assume that everybody else knows more than we do. I'm going to talk about what happens when we hide our own lack of knowledge. I'm going to talk about what happens when seniors believe that they're supposed to know more than everyone else. And I'm going to talk about the assumption that tech is the hardest part of this industry. Spoiler, it's not. OK, so first of all, I'm going to talk about this problem of judging other people based on their knowledge. I have lost count of the number of times that I have heard people say, oh, wow, I just discovered that my colleague doesn't understand why. And I'm as in the letter Y, <laughs> I've just realised that wasn't a good letter to choose, doesn't understand a particular thing. And then people express shock and disbelief that one of their colleagues doesn't know or doesn't understand something. The other one that I've heard a lot is people coming out of an interview, having interviewed somebody and saying, can you believe I just interviewed this uh, software engineer and they didn't even know what a Z was. Now, you might think that these judgments that people are making are behind the people they're judging back. So they're talking about somebody who's not in the room. They're talking about somebody they've just interviewed who doesn't know that they're saying these things about them. But even if you're not judging people in this way in front of them to their faces, what happens is whenever we hear each other make these judgments and have this scorn for people not knowing things we think they should know, what tends to happen is we internalise that. So you think, if my colleagues are saying these things about other people, how do I know they're not saying these things about me? And then you worry that you might go for a job interview and then the people are going to come out of that interview saying to each other, oh, my God, how could she not? Have? And it just contributes to this feeling that we don't know enough. People are judging us for not knowing enough. It also particularly contributes towards imposter syndrome. So just in case people haven't come across that phrase, imposter syndrome is incredibly common in this industry. And it's the feeling that people think I am more effective than I really am. People think I know more than I do. I'm pulling the wool over their eyes. I'm managing to hide my ignorance for them. But sooner or later, I'm going to get found out. I'm an imposter. They're all going to realise that I'm not what they thought I was and that really I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, that's going to be really common. I would imagine that most people here have at some point or other worried about being found out. 
And if you think about the number of people who feel like this, if everybody thinks they don't know as much as they're supposed to and they're going to find out, or a really high proportion of people do, then obviously that doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. So that's the impact of, of what happens when you are judging people for not knowing enough. So what's the solution? The solution is simply not to do it. Don't assume that because somebody can't hear you, that the other people who can hear you aren't taking that on board and internalizing it and worrying about it. And think when you judge people for not knowing stuff, do they really need to know this thing? Can they really be expected to know it? One of the things I often say is if you're interviewing somebody for a job, chances are they're already a professional. Chances are they already have a job doing um, whatever it is you're interviewing them for. And if there's something that you think they should know, but they don't, then that means that they've managed to get to this point in their career without ever having known that thing. And chances are they didn't need to know it up to this point. And I will I'll come back to that idea later. OK, so another one is laughing at people. So, for instance, the obvious one is when we laugh and sneer at people who don't understand IT. And a really common example of that is when we laugh at uh, family members or people who don't work in the industry. And unfortunately, a particularly common one is that we laugh at our mothers. Um, it's incredibly easy to laugh at our mothers for being a bit stupid and not understanding how the Internet works or how to use a laptop. The thing is, again, when people hear you laughing, that makes them feel incredibly insecure, even if you're not laughing directly at them. Often we are laughing directly at people. And again, they've managed to get to this point in their life without knowing whatever it is that we think that they should know. And particularly for people who don't work in IT, um, the more they feel that they might be laughed at, for not understanding how to use a particular um, device, the less likely it is that they will learn how to use it because they will fear that laughter before they even begin. And the same applies to our colleagues, that if they know it's likely that they're going to get laughed at for not knowing things, then the less likely they are to admit that they don't know things. Also, the less likely people outside the industry are to even think that they would ever want to work in IT. Why would they want to work in IT with all those people who are constantly laughing at them? Um, so it becomes harder to recruit. It also it becomes hard to get good user data because our users don't want to be honest with us about how difficult they find it to use the product that we are designing because they think that we will laugh at them. So that's the impact that people don't want to engage with IT or IT professionals. They don't want to work in the industry and they don't want to engage with user research. So what's the solution? The solution is empathy. The solution is to think about what it felt like the first time you learned how to do the things that you now think of as second nature. Now, interestingly, um, I find that one a bit easier than people younger than me will, because um, People who are significantly younger than me, I'm, I'm 53 years old, will have grown up using um, laptops, uh, touch screens. They probably won't even be able to remember what it felt like not to be able to use a mouse. I can remember. I can remember the first time I used a mouse. I was an adult and it was hard. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get the thing on the screen to match the movements I was making on the mouse. It felt like it was going all over the place. I couldn't make it go where I wanted it to go. And I've never forgotten what that felt like. So even if you can't remember that, think back to the times when you have had to learn something new and how hard it is and how particularly difficult it is if people laugh at you for not being able to do it. OK, so the next one I want to talk about is talking in jargon uh, and I'm going to tell you another story now I've just realized this next slide is black which isn't going to work so well on a live stream because people are going to think there's something wrong with their display um, so apologies for that um, but uh, it's it's black to encourage you to listen so I'm just going to tell you another story so imagine I'm late to a meeting where people are talking jargon and um, I don't understand what they're saying. So I arrive late and they say, oh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. We were just talking about the ARM processor, at which point I say, oh, yes, of course. But what I'm thinking is ARM. Oh, no, ARM. Ah, 
I know I've heard of that before. ARM. Meanwhile, they've said a bunch of other stuff that I didn't even hear because I'm still trying to remember what ARM stands for. In the end, I give up and say, look, I'm so sorry, but I've forgotten. What, what does ARM stand for? And somebody quickly says, oh, it's articulated retention matriculation. And now I'm thinking, oh, well, I've no idea what that is. Oh, well, never mind. I'll just work it out as I go along. And then maybe one of them will say, well, actually, we should really be considering AMRM at this point. Uh, at which point I say, AM? And they say, articulated meta-retention matriculation. Even cry for your expertise in this area. Really, we need to move on. Somebody else might say, that's a very good point. We definitely need to get meta at this juncture. And now I'm lost. I might have only just been following it, but now they're using the word meta. What does meta even mean in this context? What does meta mean in any context? It's one of those concepts that signifies that things are about to get really confusing. So other people also might be thinking, but they're not really sure what they just said, but they're very happy because they used the word junction and that makes them feel good. Now, when you use jargon, what impact does it have? What happens is that your colleagues struggle to understand what you're talking about, but they are likely to pretend that they do understand you. And then you get this weird, vicious cycle where in order to pretend that they understand and make themselves feel better and look good, they use even more jargon, often jargon that they themselves don't understand but they're trying to look good. And you get this weird, vicious cycle where everybody is obfuscating to protect themselves against judgment, which means that everybody understands less and less, and they, but they're trying to cover their tracks more and more, and the cycle continues. And another thing that can happen when you arrive in a new context, maybe a new domain, people will be using language that you don't understand because you haven't come across it yet. But then when you finally find that you do understand most of the terminology, there can be a temptation to pull the ladder up behind you. Now you're one of the gang and to prove that you're one of the gang, you can be the person who ends up using the jargon even more than anybody else, just to prove that you know it. But of course, the newcomers are even more confused. And what you've done is you've pulled the ladder up behind you. So the solution, explain your terms. Don't assume that people know. Now, obviously, there are times when um, useful terminology becomes shorthand uh, and it becomes a shortcut so that you don't have to explain everything. But you have to be certain that that is the case, that people are going to know what you're talking about. And there are two things that you can do to help mitigate that. One is that if you think there's the slightest chance that people might not know what an AMRM is, explain it. Also, another thing to do is to leave room for people to ask questions, encourage questions and ask them yourself so that they are more likely to ask when they don't know what the terminology means. Don't assume, never assume, because even if people might once have known what the term you're using means, they could easily have forgotten and then they may easily feel self-conscious about asking. So. Allow questions and ask questions yourself to encourage other people to ask them. And if you think there's a slightest chance people won't know what you mean, use more common phraseology or explain your terms. OK, so another problem that I see is that people are reluctant to train juniors. They want to hire people who are fully formed, who've already got all the skills, five years of experience in all relevant technologies, um, because we don't have time to train people up. We need everybody to just arrive in our teams and hit the ground running. Now, the problem with that is that it, typically in an industry that has a skills shortage, there won't be enough people that will fit those criteria anyway. And what tends to happen is what you're really doing is you're hoarding your own knowledge and not sharing it. So think of the times that other people shared knowledge with you and the impact of us not wanting to train juniors, not wanting to teach each other, not wanting to share the knowledge that we have, is that it only exacerbates the skills shortage. But also it creates fear. So everybody is worried that they're supposed to know everything already. They shouldn't ask questions. Nobody's got time to train them. They don't want to bother anybody by asking questions. So any gaps in their knowledge are only like to get exacerbated rather than addressed. And as teams, we want everybody in our teams to know as much as possible. 
So we don't want people to be afraid of admitting that they need some training or they need some extra knowledge or some extra context. So that's the impact. The solution is to consciously teach people all the time. So there's, there's two prongs to that. One is that never assume that your team members know everything because of course they don't because uh, there is too much to know. So always be prepared to help your colleagues to learn more stuff. Always be prepared to learn from your colleagues and be prepared to take on juniors that you are consciously training up. And when people say, oh, but we haven't got time, be aware of the benefits of training juniors. It's not just that recruitment becomes easier. It's not just that you're sharing your knowledge. Um, so it's not just altruistic. It also, we all benefit when we teach other people. So as somebody who, who's career, make, made a career out of training, teaching, mentoring, coaching, um, I, that is not entirely altruistic. I benefit from teaching because every time I have to explain something to somebody else, I deepen my own knowledge. Every time I have to explain a bit of the domain or a bit of the code base that I'm working with, I quite often discover that there are gaps in my own knowledge that I fill as a result of explaining it to somebody else. Often I find that I have to look things up and I learn more as a result. So everybody benefits from teaching because everybody's knowledge gets consolidated and deepened when they share it with other people. Um, but also when you have juniors on their team constantly asking questions, then it tends to challenge assumptions. It tends to deepen everybody's knowledge. It you tend to find out that a lot of your team members didn't know the things that the juniors are asking about, but didn't feel confident to speak up. And as a result of it being explained to the juniors, it always get also gets explained to everybody else. It's, it's a really good shot in the arm to have people around, to not have everybody be incredibly experienced. And it also helps you to understand that people can learn. Um, and one of the ways that you can uh, share that knowledge is by pairing. So th this is also um, a uh, me advocating for pairing and also um, ensemble working or mob programming, because all of this encourages people to share their knowledge and encourages learning and encourages people to explore and experiment and learn without risk. And when you allow that, it stops people from um, pushing less optimal solutions if you give them the opportunity to learn, which also gives them the opportunity to take risks. And one of the things that you can do is you can have an explicit statement towards newcomers at the start of meetings, that you have an explicit policy of curiosity, that you encourage everybody to ask questions and to be constantly learning. And there's a really nice um, concept here, which is the lucky 10,000. And this is about, um, your attitude to people who don't know stuff. And this is an XKCD comic, and there's a lot of text here, so I will, I'll talk you through it. Um, and, and what he says is that he tries not to make fun of people for admitting that they don't know things. And he gives, he, he, he does a bit of spurious math. He, he um, gives the example of the Diet Coke and Mentos thing, and he says, he imagines that by the time everybody's 30, they've all heard of it which in itself is probably not true. Um, and then he says that uh, it based on the, the US birth, weight, birth rate, he therefore calculates that there are 10,000 people a day finding out about the Diet Coke and Mentos thing. And his point is, and the Diet Coke and Mentos thing, if you don't know, is that if you take a Mento, a mint sweet, I don't think it, I don't think it works with any mint sweet, um, but it, it does work with Mentos, put it in a bottle of Coke, stand back and wait and there will be a chemical reaction that will cause the coke to foam up out of the bottle and make a fountain. Now what he's saying is that if he meets somebody who doesn't know the diet coke and mentos thing and goes oh what about the diet coke and mentos thing have you been living under a rock? So making fun of them for not knowing about it. If you have that attitude nobody wins. The person feels bad you get to sneer at them but if you have the attitude that Oh, if they don't know about the Diet Coke and Mentos thing, that makes them one of today's lucky 10,000. They get to find out this fantastic thing. And not only that, but you get to be the person who teaches it to them and gets to see their reaction when they discover it. So celebrate the lucky 10,000. 
celebrate when people don't know things and you get to teach it to them. Don't feel grumpy about the fact that you're going to have to spend your time explaining something to somebody. Get excited about being able to go on that journey with them because they are one of today's lucky 10,000. And what we're doing here is reframing you don't know into you have the opportunity to learn. So another problem that happens a lot in this industry, which is related to things I've already said, is this idea of gatekeeping. So the idea that uh, you have very narrow recruitment policies where you uh, have a job description that you publish. And what you're really doing is describing a unicorn. So you're saying that you want somebody who has five years of experience of this and five years of experience of that. And they need to have this, use this technology and that technology. And they need to have done this and that and the other. Um, and what you're doing is describing typically all of the technologies that you use at your workplace and all of the skills that are used. And you're saying you want somebody who can already do all of that stuff. The impact is that you can't find the right people. You can't fill those vacancies or it's very difficult to fill those vacancies. So what's the solution? The solution is to think what is actually required for competency? And when you recognize just how broad this industry is and just how many the millions of possible permutations of skills and technologies that each individual project, never mind each individual company has, it's very difficult to find somebody who has experience of all of those things. And in fact, because it's so difficult, what really happens is that we all keep constantly learning on the job and we can do that. We get very good at it because we have to get very good at it. And if people don't know enough, why is it? What's deterring them? Instead of looking for people who have the exact skills that you require, what you should do instead is focus on what I call attitude and aptitude. Are they willing and able to learn? That's what you need. People who are willing and able to learn, not people who already have all of this knowledge cast in stone in their brains. So uh, a really good um, way of addressing this is to deliberately seek out career changes, run boot camps, run programs. So I used to work for MedTech and I helped to teach our academy program, which was deliberately targeted at people who didn't have IT degrees, didn't have tons of experience, had done just, just enough coding to know that they wanted to do it. And then what we were able to do was take those people and shape them and train them to have the skills that we wanted them to have. And so what we were doing was we were recruiting people that had attitude and aptitude. And we deliberately also aimed at career changes because when you have career changes, what you get is people who have amazing ranges of skills that don't appear to be what you want, but actually gives them a, a real breadth of experience and talent and gives them a ton of transferable skills that become useful in ways that you never could have predicted. So you never would have been able to, to design that job description. But what you get is surprises and surprises are good. Also, um, if, when you, if you specify that everybody who joins your company should have a, a, a computing degree, often those degrees aren't fit for purpose. They don't cover the things that you want them to cover. They're not designed to uh, cope somebody, prepare somebody to actually do the job of software engineering. And when you ask for computing degrees, you have to ask yourselves, are you doing that because you really need people to have computing degrees or just because the senior people in your organization all have them and don't like the idea that they might not be as useful as they thought? Because the range of knowledge in our industry is very wide. I like, can't see my arms. My arms are stretched out now. They're stretched right out. The range of knowledge in our industry is very, very wide. Just because somebody hasn't encountered the thing you think that they need to know doesn't mean they wouldn't be an asset. So don't ask whether people have what you need. Ask what they do have. They might have skills and knowledge you've never even thought of. And because the range, not only uh, is the, are the range of technologies, tools, languages, um, very big, very, very big, it's increasing at an exponential rate. So it is impossible to find somebody who knows all the things. And it is very, actually surprisingly easy to find two experienced senior industry professionals who have no crossover 
in what they both know. There will always be gaps in people's knowledge. And what you have to do is embrace that. OK, so another problem that I see is this idea of rock star developers, this idea that you should go and find um, the golden nuggets, the people who are amazing. And I'm afraid that just that very idea, the idea that these amazing people exist, suggests that everybody else isn't amazing. Everybody else is just the chaff. And it creates the divide. It encourages people to be very arrogant and think of themselves as being above everyone else, which makes them less likely to share their knowledge. And it encourages everybody else to have no ambition to not believe that they are, they could ever pos possibly reach those giddy heights, which makes them less likely to embrace learning and seek new knowledge. Another problem that can happen is when we assume that everybody else knows more than we do. Now, I have this thing that I call the wheel of confusion. These are all photos of people that I used to work with at ThoughtWorks. That's me down at the bottom with different hair. Um, and we, uh, there is it, within ThoughtWorks, there is an internal message board. And there are thousands of software engineers all over the world all contributing to this message board. And it can be incredibly intimidating. When you look down it and you look at all the different topics that are being discussed. When I created this slide, which was a few years ago now, but most of these terms are still relevant. I just I just looked at the message board on one day and just picked out a ton of titles of threads that re that reference things that I didn't know e e very much or even anything about. And when you see all of these topics being discussed, and you think, but I don't know anything about any of those things. And look at all of these people. Each one of these threads was started by somebody who seems extremely confident and knowledgeable. And look, at all those people who know all of those things. And I don't. What you're not taking account of is that Andy here is also looking at all of the people who know all of the things. And he only knows about the things in his one thread. And he's also worrying about it. And Anik is thinking the same thing about all of the people who know all of the things. And Ezra is thinking too. And so is Georgia. And so is Ileana. And so is John. And so is Kirsty. And so is Mircha. And so is Rob. And so is Scott. They are all thinking that. So what you have to remind yourself is that everybody knows something about something. Nobody knows everything about everything. You have to remind yourself that everybody has gaps in their knowledge and it's OK. So don't. Don't assume that everybody else knows more than you. Everybody else knows different things than you. And that's not the same thing. Pay attention to those faces on the wheel of confusion. Another problem that I see is when people hide their own ignorance. So they're, they're so worried about being judged that they're not honest about what they don't know. Uh, and the little story that I'm going to tell here is um, when I went to the hairdresser and the hairdresser um, did some fancy stuff to my hair. And this is a quote. This is why I have very little hair these days, uh, because when I go to the hairdresser and they do amazing things with my hair and then I go home and I, it lasts for, what, 24 hours and then I can't maintain it. I can never make it look again like it did when I was in the hairdressers. I never had that skill. I have no idea how to do those amazing things with hair. Uh, but I was in the hairdresser one time and the hairdresser did amazing things with my hair and then said, um, you do have straighteners, don't you? Uh, the answer was no, no, I don't have straighteners. And if I did, I would have no idea how to use them. And what they were saying is that I would need straighteners in order to maintain this amazing hairstyle they'd given me. But I didn't say, no, I don't have straighteners. Because that was obviously the answer they expected. So I didn't admit that I couldn't do a thing or that I didn't know how to do a thing. I just pretended that I did know how to do the thing. And this is really common because we worry about being laughed at. We worry about being judged. So we're not open about things that we don't know. And we think that we're protecting ourselves when we do this. But actually, not only does it damage ourselves, it damages our whole teams. So it damages our teams because our teams actually need us to know what we're doing in order to operate effectively. And if we don't know what we're doing, we're not going to be able to do such a good job. And that's why it is in the interest of everybody to encourage everybody to ask questions and be open about what they don't know. They won't do that if you frown at them when they do. If you have that attitude of hooray you don't know a thing I can help you learn a thing this is exciting we can gain new knowledge together 
then people are much more likely to be open about what they don't know. And they're much more likely to therefore learn what they need to know as a result. And one of the things that I do to help that is that um, I ask, I deliberately ask simple questions myself. And I deliberately swallow my pride and don't worry about looking stupid so that I'm modeling that behavior and letting everybody know that it's okay to ask simple questions and to not know stuff. We should all be encouraging people to ask questions. Now, this is an interesting one, particularly for people in senior positions when they think that they should know more than everybody else. And again, it's similar to the last one. If you feel like you're supposed to know more than everybody else, then you won't be honest about it when you don't. Uh, but you're also holding up an unrealistic expectation to everybody else who thinks that the only way they can become senior is if they know more than everybody else. And actually, particularly if you're in a leadership position, you should celebrate it when people less senior than you know more than you, when they know things that you don't. This is a good thing. You want to be surrounded by people who know more than you because you want to be working with a strong team and you want to be able to learn from them. So don't assume no matter where you are in an organizational hierarchy, do not feel like you're supposed to know more than everybody else. That is unrealistic and unhelpful. OK, so. Um, don't assume that the tech is the hard part, because a, a lot of this stuff that I've been talking about is actually about people, people call soft skills. I don't like soft because it, it, it sounds like it's less important if it's soft. We need to be able to collaborate. We need to be able to be humble. We need to be able to be honest with people about what we don't know. We need to be patient with people who need to learn. We need to be willing to share what we know. We need to be generous with what we know. We need to be excited about learning new things. These are all soft skills. These are the things that are hard and these are the things that are important. So to end on a happy note, um, to go back to my experience, so I told the story at the, at the top uh, of how I left the industry. Um, and the, if you've done the maths, you might have worked out that I said I've been a software engineer for 22 years, but I left the industry after 12 years. So I was made redundant. I did, didn't think I was coming back. I left the industry altogether for four years. And during that four year period, I did not think that I was coming back. I was not trying to keep up with technology. Um, but uh, I actually retrained as a high school math teacher and it was pretty much a disaster, to be honest. I discovered that, uh, that just being excited about maths is not enough to persuade teenagers to be excited about maths or indeed to behave themselves in a classroom. And um, so I ended up coming back into IT because it was the only thing I knew how to do. But this is where the happy ending comes in. Because I had had that break, I deliberately came back into the industry entry level. Also, I'd taken a cut in income, so I was used to earning less. So I, I came back in at entry level and I just said, look, let's pretend that I never was a software engineer. Let, I, I, I joined a company that specialized in taking on graduates and training them up. And I was like, I'm just going to join with the rest of these graduates. I can't remember anything that I used to know. I was already losing interest and my, my, my knowledge was already kind of degrading towards the end of my the last bit of my career. So uh, and I don't and I, I'd never done web development and I just let's just start again. And the great thing about that was particularly because I'd been a teacher and to be honest, when I was in the classroom, I used to get jealous of pupils for, be, for being able to spend their whole day learning. I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn without shame or embarrassment. And by saying, let's just pretend I'm brand new. It meant that I didn't have to have any embarrassment or shame about asking all of the questions all of the time uh, and asking really simple questions and saying, I don't know, don't know how to do this. I don't know about this stuff. And what's interesting is that because I had that attitude, because I came back embracing learning, um, my experience was completely different in the second half of my career to what it had been in the first half. I didn't have those insecurities anymore. I embraced learning. I got excited about learning, didn't get embarrassed about it, and I didn't get ashamed of it. And not only did that mean that I progressed much more quickly and I enjoyed things much more, it also meant that people respected me. And this is a really interesting, really interesting thing. We often think that if we admit that we don't know stuff, then people will judge us particularly if we're in senior positions or if we're consultants. We feel like, well, we're, we, we're selling ourselves as experts, so therefore we can never admit to not knowing anything. The opposite is true. 
if you don't admit what you don't know, then you are going to come unstuck. But if you confidently and unashamedly admit that you don't know things, people love it. There are two ways of asking questions. If you say, oh, I'm really stupid, I'm sorry, I don't know that, oh, can you explain that to me? People will judge you, I'm afraid. They shouldn't, but they will. If you project yourself as being stupid and not worthy of help. But if instead you say, right, OK, so I understand this thing and I understand this thing, but this is the bit that I don't get. And if you are able to confidently explain what you don't know and why, and it could simply it could be as simple as, you know what, I think I studied that one, but it was years ago and I've forgotten all about it. Remind me, what's that about? People don't judge you for that. And if they do, they can spot off, to be honest. But most people don't. They respect it. And it makes them feel good when they don't know stuff, particularly helps people in junior positions. And the, the net result of it all is that I am so much happier in my career and more successful. And that's the happy ending. So I'm going to finish with this thing that I call the stupidity manifesto. And this is a really nice quote from a guy called Aaron Schwartz, who sadly isn't with us anymore. Uh, but I love that. What people call intelligence just boils down to curiosity. Be curious. It's not about knowing things. It's about being able and willing to learn things. So let's stop making people feel stupid. Instead, let's have an explicit policy of curiosity towards all things. Let's encourage each other to shout out if we discourage curiosity. Let's what ask, ask what people need to know, not what they do know. Let's never judge anyone because their knowledge doesn't match ours. Let's give our colleagues every opportunity to learn and explore without risk. Let's give new people a chance to show us what they can do rather than what we want them to be able to do. And we'll find that they know a bunch of stuff that we hadn't even thought we needed. Let's encourage everyone to ask questions. And let's acknowledge the broad range of knowledge in our industry. And remember that our industry never stays the same. We all forget stuff. And let's lead by example. Let's be honest when we're confused and focus on aptitude rather than knowledge. Remember what it feels like when we're still learning and take account of that. Prioritize clarity over jargon. And remember that all of this that I'm talking about is not idealism, it's pragmatism. We're not going to be able to recruit. We're not going to be able to do work unless we celebrate learning. Let's stop making each other feel stupid. OK, so what I'd like you to do is just have a think about how what can you do to make things even better wherever you are? What what can you take away from this talk? Because the most useful talks are the ones that result in action. So I hope that you can think of something that you might be able to do differently uh, as a result of uh, having listened to me today. Uh, this is completely gratuitous. This is my son, Felix, looking happy because everything's going well, because he's embracing learning. Felix is the one on the left. OK, so um, something that might be useful. I hosted uh, the first season of the Making Tech Better podcast. Uh, there are some episodes in particular, there are uh, 20, 27 episodes, I think, altogether. But these ones in particular are relevant to what I've been talking about today. So in each episode, I interviewed somebody. Uh, I interviewed Jessica Kerr on team learning and Emily Weber, on, Emily Weber on communities of practice, Charlene Hunter on diversity and training, Craig Bass on how to build an academy, and Dr. Jay Harrison on inclusive teams. I think all of those episodes would be particularly relevant to what I've been talking about today. And the URL is there on the slide. Um, so and this is another uh, happy example of somebody doing well with no blockers. That's actually my son, Oscar, again, showing off. So thank you. You can reach me on Twitter or LinkedIn if you'd like me to come and help your teams to improve their software engineering techniques and to learn. Um, are there any questions? Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, that was very, how do I say in English, um, very uh, touching. <laughs> and uh, I see a lot of comments in the YouTube uh, chat. Uh, it looks like everyone's um, enjoying the presentation. And on Twitter, I see one question. 
And the question is, uh, yes, the question from uh, at underscore Grunit. And the question is, have you ever faced resistance from teams or people on changing their behavior around looking down on folks who don't know certain things, explicit or implicit? Mm, okay. So I think the resistance comes it very particularly in the area of recruitment. So I, it, it, what's really interesting is that if you say to people, uh, it's really good to embrace learning and it's good to help each other and it's good to help each other learn. Nobody can really disagree with that. And I'm not sure anybody ever does directly disagree with that. But what people do disagree about is this idea that we can recruit people who need training or that we can help each other to learn. And that's when people start saying, oh, but we don't have time. We can't afford it. We need people to hit the ground running. Um, uh, and, you know, people should just be able to do this stuff. And, and that's when I say, you know what, that would be lovely, but how are you doing with that recruitment? Because actually, it's really hard. And if you want teams who are able to do stuff, then taking on juniors is a really good way of getting people who can do stuff. And all you have to do is change your mindset. And also, the thing to do is if you don't think it can work, try it out and see. So just bringing one junior onto your team can have amazing benefits if you're open to it and if you're looking out for those benefits. Um, I, and really, that, that would be my answer to a lot of things. Try it out and see. But, but actually, no, not very much resistant because it's hard to, to, to say to somebody's face, but I don't think we should celebrate learning because why on earth not? <laughs> um, and, and really, a lot of the time, it's about being confident to say those things, because it is unlikely you'll face resistance, in fact. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, the resistance might be also like getting laughed about changing the laughing culture, so it might be tough. But Yeah, yeah. and, and that, <laughs> you do that by example. So, um, you, and that, that, that is hard. So if you're if you feel like you're the only voice, if everybody in your team is routinely laughing at people and judging people, um, then ideally you want to call them out on that, point it out and point out the impact. If you are the only voice saying that, that's difficult. And there are two um, things you can do in that circumstance. One is to quietly talk to people behind the scenes and find people who quietly agree with you and come to some agreement that you between you, you will both address that behavior. But if really everybody about you is showing that attitude, then maybe it's time to change company. Um, there's a quote from Martin Fowler. I might not get it exactly right, but it, it, it's, it's something like, if you can't change change the company, change your company. Uh, so if you really are surrounded by that kind of toxic environment, then maybe it's time to seek out people who have a better attitude because there are plenty of people who do. I see. Uh, it's kind of a good... Uh, not good segue, but next question is, so if you're looking for a job, how to find companies that live by these principles? Is it possible to recognize them just looking at their job postings? Yeah. What you want to know is, first of all, do they take on juniors? So interestingly, it can be very tempting to look at companies who say everybody who works here is amazing. And we have we have a really rigid recruitment policy. We only ever take on senior engineers with years and years of experience. And everybody who works here is super clever and super brilliant. I, I, I won't touch companies like that with a barge pole. That is a big red flag for me, because what that tells me is that they're actually quite elitist. And they probably because if you think about it, if you join a company that has said to you, everybody who works here is amazing everybody is high caliber then you're instantly going to be worried as soon as you go through the door because you're going to be thinking what if I don't measure up what if I'm not as good as these other people what what if they what if they've recruited me by accident much more likely to feel imposter syndrome and also what that tells you is that they're not going to be forgiving or sympathetic when you don't know stuff and I say when not if 
there will be things that you don't know no matter how amazing you are so instead what you want to do is find companies who who um who take on juniors who train up juniors who have their own training schemes and also whose job descriptions are not tightly defined so rather than saying everybody should have these exact skills and these exact technologies you want job descriptions that say things like we welcome an open attitude to learning we focus on continuous improvement and continuous learning and um, we want people to learn we're going to provide opportunities for you to learn we have a good training budget we help you to learn the things rather than we don't expect you to know for instance uh, we, we we work in java but we understand that c-sharp developers have all the skills that java developers have and we understand that you would be able to learn those are the companies that you want to look for oh, i see thank you uh, we have several more questions but unfortunately it's almost time so if you have more questions i think you can ask clear directly uh, mm -hmm. to, um, uh, find, find uh, me on twitter you... is probably the easiest yeah. way but you can also um, ping me on linkedin so you can uh, paste uh, links for those um, um, medias on YouTube chat so ah, people can. Yes, thank you, uh, I will. So with that, I would like to hand over to Eric over there, Eric. Yeah, uh, thanks, Kenji. Thank you, Claire, for uh, such a lovely talk. Um, spoilers, these questions are pretty good. So, you know, brace yourself. Um, also, uh, you know, I saw a lot of my professional career flashing before my eyes through your talk, so uh, it really resonated with me. Um, also, a special shout out to uh, Trina, um, our gold sponsor, UX for the win, for just being really engaging in the chat. Uh, I really love to see it, so a um, little shout out there. And uh, if you enjoyed this talk, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, first off, you can hit that like button on YouTube, which will say, I like this talk and it will stay on YouTube forever. Uh, you can also use the subscribe button, which is a great way to get updates for future ID24 content. Uh, a reminder that Inclusive Design 24 is a welcoming community. You can find a link to our code of conduct on the footer of every page on the inclusivedesign24.org website. Uh, furthermore, Inclusive Design is brought to you by the following sponsors. Uh, Fable, Intopia, Barrier Break, TPGI, UX for the Win, Equal Entry, Infoaxia, Intuit, the Law Office of Laney Feingold, Adrian Roselli, LLC, and WebAble. Uh, thanks to their generosity, we are able to bring this conference to you for free, so we really appreciate them sharing time and resources with us. And we'll be back on the top of the hour with our next session. So um, thank you again, uh, Claire and Kenji. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you. <laughs>